This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'd just like to preface um, my speech by mentioning that I used to work at the Victoria and Albert Museum and one of the jobs that I did as an assistant curator was opening the post. And as a consequence, um, this paper comes out of work that I did while I was working at the V&A and is in no way res- related to my current PhD research. So... In June 2006, the Furniture, Textile and Fashion Department of the Victoria and Albert Museum received a package in the post. The parcel contained a large linen bedsheet and a photograph of a woman in 19th century dress with an accompanying note. The donor provided no name or contact details. The sheet, now part of the V&A textile collection, T16-2007, comprises two widths of handwoven linen joined along the selvages by a bobbin lace insertion and finished at the corners and at the end of of the insertion with tassels. The bobbin lace insertion relates very closely to early lace designs depicted in the 16th century pattern book, such as the Neue Mürrebüch, published in Zürich in 1561, and to lace bordering a German altar cloth dated 1590 in the V&A collection. Likewise, the linen tassels, seemingly built up from buttonhole or some related stitch, are very similar to some concetto tassels, edging a sheet from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and to a set of linen tassels belonging to the Gandini collection in Modena. Both examples date from the early years of the 17th century, and it is likely that the v sheet was made at a similar date. Of particular interest, however, are the six sets of initials embroidered in pink silk around the edges of the sheet, four of which bear dates ranging from 1786 to 1900. According to the note that accompanied the anonymous donation, these initials refer, and this is all of them, these initials refer to the individuals for whose laying out after death the sheet was used. A carte de visite photograph of the last of these, Sarah Blunt, nay Stafforth, of Whittlesea in the Isle of Ely, represented by the SB 1900, embroidered centre-left on the top edge of the sheet, was included with the sheet. So there she is. The sheet is a very special object for a number of reasons. From the viewpoint of the textile historian, the combination of early bobbin lace and rare stitched tassels with handwoven linen is unusual and exciting. The embroidered initials and dates, however, hold wider interest, providing an opportunity to link the sheet with specific people and places, a way into lives that might otherwise be unexplored. The sheet is in superb condition for an item of domestic linen and has clearly been cherished. Luxurious when new, assiduous care has ensured the rare survival of the tassels and prevented the discoloration so common in old linen. It is likely that the life of the sheet has been prolonged by its occasional use. It evidently predates the earliest of the dated initials by nearly 200 years, however, and would probably have once been in more general use. I wonder whether it would be possible to trace the individuals who had used the sheet through the 19th century to try to build up a picture of their lives and the significance of the sheet in this context. I started by looking for Sarah Blunt. Thanks to the registration of births, marriages and deaths from 1837, it was easy to search for deaths registered in 1900. I hit a problem almost straight away, however, as the only Sarah Blunt that I could find that year died in Loughborough, aged 85. This didn't fit with the age of the woman in the photograph, who looked to be about 40 when the photograph was taken, circa 1870. I decided to try a different strategy and instead identify Sarah using her unusual maiden name of Stafford. As I already knew that she married a man by the name of Blunt, I started by looking for marriages. On the 14th of May, 1851, in the parish church of Bury in Huntingdonshire, Sarah Sarah Stafford married James Blunt, a farmer and land agent. Both were of full age. The marriage was witnessed by Sarah's uncles, William and Samuel Stafford, and her aunt, Betsy Eakins. Both the Staffords and the Blunts were yeoman farmers. They owned substantial tracts of land and were people of some means and influence in the area where they lived. The Blunt family appears to have lived in and around Whittlesea for several generations before the birth of James Blunt. Similarly, the Staffords seem to have been established in and around nearby Ramsey from the 1570s. Although I spent some time looking for a member of the Blunt family who died in 1851, I now believe that it is in fact this marriage that is recorded as JSB 1851 on the top edge of the (coughs) ship. While it is possible that the sheet was used as a laying out cloth, the embroidered initials do not appear to relate to this aspect of its use. This interpretation significantly alters the meaning of the object and the commemoration it represents, associated not with death, but instead with other noteworthy events in its owner's lives. Sarah Stafford was born in Ramsey on the 25th of January 1827. 
Her parents, Pyatt Stafford and Mary Johnson, were married by licence in Wistow in 1820, and I am certain that the embroidery PMS 1828 on the top right-hand corner of the sheet refers to them, though I am less sure why they chose to commemorate this date. Pyatt Stafford died in 1830, aged 34. His will shows a prosperous farmer with household goods, livestock, farming equipment and considerable land holdings. The land was divided between Sarah and her brother Abraham to be held in trust by Mary until they were of age. The household goods went to Mary and the stock and farming gear to William and Samuel Stafford, his brothers. Mary Stafford died in 1836, also aged 34. William and Samuel Stafford were the executors of her will, as they had been of her husband's, and she left Abraham and Sarah in their care. Abraham definitely lived with Samuel and his wife Sarah Elizabeth for some time, as he appears as a member of their household in the census returns for 1841. During the same period, Sarah was attending a school in Huntington High Street, run by the Mrs Fox. Mary's father, Edward Johnson, died in 1828, and it is likely that the sheep passed to Mary at this point. Edward Johnson's will named Mary as sole executrix and left his lands in Wistow, where he was living at the time of his death, and wholly welcome needing it <coughs> for her. In addition, she was granted everything in and about my house and premises in Wistow, which probably included the sheet. Edward Johnson left lands around Warboys to his other daughter, Betsy, and <coughs> £365 to her husband, Thomas Eakins. His son, Wilson Johnson, received £400. If my assessment is correct, and PMS 1828 does indeed refer to Pyatt and Mary Stafford, it is interesting that Mary chose to mark the transferal of the sheet rather than to record the date of their marriage. This suggests that the embroidery fulfilled a function other than that of documenting events, possibly of claiming ownership. Following this pattern, it is probable that the ESJ 1786, the earliest dated set of initials on the sheet, refers to Mary's parents. From his will, it is clear that Edward Johnson was Mary's father. Let's go back. That Edward Johnson was Mary's father, but there are no references to his wife, who must have died before he wrote this will in 1828. According to census information given later in their lives, Wilson and Betsy were born in Huntingdonshire, although I can find no reference to the baptism of either child, which will provide the name of their mother. The International Genealogy Index, however, shows an Edward Johnson marrying Sarah Wilson at Gamlingay in 1787. The will of Joseph Wilson, wheelwright of Gamlingay, of 1791, refers to my daughter Sarah, the wife of Edward Johnson of Houghton with Whitton. Given also Wilson Johnson's first name, and that he gave his place of birth on the 1851 census as Whitton, Huntingdonshire, it seems likely that Sarah Wilson of Gamlingay was the mother of Wilson, Mary and Betsy Johnson. Again, the date on the initials does not refer, refer directly to the date of the marriage. So that's this one. In this instance, it probably relates to Sarah and Edward's betrothal, and in this context, the preparation of linens by Sarah to take to her new home as a married woman. It seems likely that the last two sets of initials on the sheet, undated and presumably the earliest, relate to Sarah Wilson's family. JMW must be Joseph Wilson and his first wife, Mary Linton, married in Gamlingay in 1757. Following this logic, the final set of initials, IML, should refer to Mary Linton's parents, but here the pattern breaks down. In fact, Mary Linton's parents were almost certainly John Linton, a Thatcher, and Ellen Lawrence, who married in Holywell in 1722. The snapshots of Sarah and James Blunt and their growing family provided by the 10 yearly census show comfortably off farmers responsible for a number of labourers and servants. Sarah and James had three children, Emma, Agnes and Herbert. At some point between 1871 and 1874, the Blunt family moved to Tunbridge Wells. James farmed here and owned land in the area which is mentioned in his will. Their son, Herbert William Blunt, studied history at Oriel College, Oxford, matriculating in 1882. He was awarded a first in classics in 1886 and went on to win the Arnold Essie Prize the following year for a piece on the collapse of democracy in Rome. In 1888, Herbert was awarded a studentship or fellowship at Christ Church and he remained at the college for the rest of his working life, serving as a librarian from 1908 to 1928. There is little documentation of Herbert's academic life, although he did contribute an essay on logic to the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica and several book reviews to the philosophical journal Mind. He was a founder member of the Climbers Club and appears as a boarder at a hotel in the Welsh Mountains, the 1891 census, clearly using the vacation to pursue this hobby. Herbert married Jane Weston, who had witnessed his mother's will in 1896, in 1899. Sarah Blunt did not die in 1900. The 1901 census shows her living with her elder daughter, Emma, at number one, Marlborough Road, Lee, Lewisham. 
Charles Booth's survey of this area shows it as a well-to-do, and indeed, Emma and Sarah, Emma, Sarah and Emma had two servants, both from Cambridgeshire. Sarah describes herself as a widow, living on no means. She was 74. When Sarah did die, early in 1902, her elder daughter, Emma, was 43 and unmarried. Agnes, her younger daughter, had married Thomas Herbert Sowerby, a successful soap manufacturer, in 1896, but had no children and was to die shortly after her mother. Sarah had become a grandmother in 1900 when Herbert and Jane Weston's first child, Henry Pyatt Blunt, was born. Several months after Sarah's death, Herbert and Jane had a daughter, Eleanor Dorothea Blunt. A further daughter, Phyllis Mary Blunt, was born the following year. The 1911 census shows Emma living with, and probably keeping house for, her widowed brother-in-law, Thomas Sowerby, in Blackheath. She never married and died in 1931. It is most likely that the sheep passed to one of Herbert's children. In this context, the final dated initials, SB 1900, are particularly confusing. Perhaps Sarah wanted to mark the century, or felt that, after longer as a widow than as a married woman, some record of her life alone was important. The sheet seems to have been passed from mother to daughter for several generations, laundered and stored with care. The care continued into the 20th century, but no embroidered initials were added. If the initials on the sheet had only recorded those for whom the sheet had been used during the ritual of laying out, the demise of this practice during the 20th century might account for the change. As, as, as has been seen, however, the initials and dates refer to other people and other events. The big question here is why embroider, why embroider initials on a sheet at all? Although commemorative textiles are not unusual, and the use of cross-stitch here echoes both needlework samplers and pre-laundry linen marking, no other sheets embroidered in this way are known. Perhaps in the Fens in the 17th century, embroidering the initials of married couples onto high-quality bed linen was common, and yet there is no evidence to suggest that this was the case. Similarly, there is no way of knowing how this extremely swanky item first came into the possession of these families of artisans and yeomen. In some ways, the sheet is a little like the writing at the front of a family Bible, chronicling births, marriages and deaths, and yet the record is far from complete, providing only the faintest clues to the lives it documents. The fragmentary and conflicting nature of the memorial suggests that it was in fact never about remembering. If the dates are clearly related to marriages, then the significance of the sheet would be much more obvious, suggesting a special cover for the marriage bed on the wedding night. This is not the case, however, so what was it for? I think that instead, it is somehow bound up with the strong family ties inherent in the farming community. It is no coincidence that the practice ended after Sarah's family became city dwellers, although this can also be seen as part of the greater mobility and of the breakdown of extended family and community common in the late 19th and 20th centuries. This elastic sense of family can also be seen in naming practices. Herbert William Blunt named his only son after a grandfather he had never met, who in turn had as his Christian name the maiden name of his great-great-grandmother, Sarah Pyatt, who married Abraham Stafford in 1731. The use of names in this way has little to do with the remembrance of loved individuals, instead reflecting a less personal sense of continuity and connection, perhaps also of ownership, the names reflecting the passing on of worldly goods, and in particular, land. Given the mother-daughter transferal of the sheet, it could be read as a record of fem female tenure, but this is at odds with the reality of the distribution of property among these families, which appear to reflect individuals and circumstances rather than gendered rules of ownership. Certainly, Joseph Wilson left his wheelwright premises and business to his nephew James, a wheelwright, rather than to his daughter, but Edward Johnson left his land to his daughters rather than his son. Mary Stafford left her household goods to be divided equally between her son and her daughter, and so did Sarah Blunt. This interpretation also ignores the fact that the embroidery, with one exception, refers to married couples. Ultimately, we cannot know the reason why initials were embroidered on the sheet, the significance of this, and the way that this affected the way the sheet was used. Apart from anything else, the embroidery was probably carried out over a period of at least 130 years by a number of different people, all of whom may have had different motives for adding their initials to the sheet. By the time Sarah Blunt acquired the sheet, her understanding of family tradition would have played a part in her embroidery. If nothing else, the sheet opens a window onto her life and that of her family, dead but not forgotten.